Hello and welcome to 2024 Cleveland Browns team preview. We have Deshaun Watson taken back over for Joe Flacco. Can he finally live up to that big dollar contract? Nick Chubb is hurt dog, but maybe he'll be back sooner than we're thinking. Amari Cooper, wide receiver one, although he is starting to get a little older finally. David Njoku coming off a career year as well. All that and much more coming up in the next 30 minutes. Stay tuned. We're talking all things Cleveland Browns. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's joined, as always, by Fantasy Life Director of Analytics and all-around baller, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. And Dwayne, as a native Ohioan, I've been alive a very long time, and the Browns have seldom ever been good, to be honest with you. But last year, they were. Plus 34-point differential in the regular season. That was the first time they finished in the green since 2007. Shout out to Derek Anderson and that squad. So this was despite the offense racking up a league high 37 turnovers, life with Miles Garrett and company, and the reigning number one ranked defense in EPA per play. Pretty good in Cleveland last year. Obviously, you know, clock struck midnight on their fair on their Cinderella story, you know, against the Texans in the playoffs. But hey, man, with new year, new Cleveland Browns, perhaps. So the big question. Because they got there with a, you know an assortment of backup quarterbacks. Joe Flacco played pretty darn great down the stretch, but this is back to being Deshaun Watson's team. And yeah, we can explain away some of the numbers. Let's face it, he has only started 12 games over the last three seasons. The first one, a lot of it was marred by rust and also December weather. Last year, he was really dealing with rotator cuff and shoulder injuries, you know, throughout the start of the year. I believe he got the initial injury. I think it was even in week one, man. He scored that touchdown right before halftime, and he kind of got slammed on it, only got worse as it went on. With that caveat, he's been one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL in Cleveland. Among 46 qualified QBs, 38th in EPA per dropback, 40th in completion percentage over expected, 42nd in PFF pass grade. Yeah, you're not going to be able to find an advanced metric that paints him as very good. And this is a guy, Dwayne, who only trailed Patrick Mahomes and Drew Brees in EPA and CPOE composite score from 2017 to 2020. So with Watson, all that said, he did manage to register three top 12 finishes in his essential five full games last year. You buying in fantasy land because the man has never been cheaper and he remains somehow one of only four quarterbacks in NFL history to average at least 20 fantasy points per game for their career. Well, I was wrongly in on Deshaun Watson last year. Yeah, and I will say I've, no, I I, I've, well, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Um, this guy averaged 25, 22, 22 and 24 fantasy points per game over the last two years, 15.1 and 14.8. Now, several of those, he left the game with injury. So that's that's making those numbers look even worse. But I just, you know, I don't know, man. I, I don't know what to say about this guy. I think at this point, we have to think that what he's been the last two years is the new reality. That means that he's probably going to blow up and do the opposite <laughs> thing because that's the way fantasy football works. I mean, the last full season we saw him in Houston, he averaged 301 passing yards per game. He's at 184 and 186 over the last two years. So... Deshaun's funny. When I watch him, I think this looks absolutely terrible. And then to your point, somehow in those full games, it does look like, okay, a low end QB one, but I'm not comfortable with it. Like it's one of those that even though the points sometimes come, I'm watching it and going, dear God, like this is just really bad football. So I think Deshaun Watson's broken at this point. You know, that, obviously we know the ceiling is there. So that's something that he has in the range that he's going. Uh, of these drafts as the forgotten man you can literally you can get Des deshaun watson won't be drafted in many of y'all's leagues yeah okay he won't be drafted like you're gonna have to either be in super flex or playing in best ball quite often to see deshaun watson drafted so i will say you get to a certain point you know and you're like well he has at least shown me he can be a 20 plus fantasy point per game guy i really like the coordinator or i like the off the the head coach stefanski we'll we'll talk more about the new coordinator here in a second um i like amari cooper i don't love him i like him um jerry judy at least it's they're trying you know elijah moore <laughs> kind of fell through last year david and joku is a good tight end like there's they're some decent trying. weapons so look it could happen i'm not going out of my way but i'm definitely making sure i at least get a few shares if i'm drafting one fantasy team deshaun watson i probably just cross him off the list before the draft happens but that's that's probably recency bias because i was trying to be in on him last year as a guy that could be a cheat code versus the top quarterbacks that were going earlier than ever, and that didn't work out. So I think, though, where we're at, Ian, we have to assume that he's broken. 
I think he does make for a pretty great, if you want to draft a second quarterback at the very end of, you know, your home league draft, he's the wild card. Because if we see him go out there week one against the Cowboys and all of a sudden, you know, 275, two touchdowns through the air and runs one in, it's going to be an argument to get him right back in the top 12. This could be, Dwayne, the first offense that he is in where they actually do fully embrace the passing game because of the injury with Nick Chubb. So I understand that did happen early in last season. We had a few games, but again, shoulder issues from the beginning. Want to try to give him a little bit of credit. I mean, look, the last two games we saw him, the Cardinals game, he was actually throwing more downfield dimes than I would say the rest of his you know, games in Cleveland combined. And that Baltimore Ravens comeback, bro, that ball did not hit the ground in the second half despite him playing through the pain so not completely you know ruling it out and again I think it's just a matter of Kirk Cousins Matthew Stafford Aaron Rodgers Baker Mayfield like those are the guys priced around Watson and they just do not even fit the same sort ceiling of, you know archetype yeah his ceiling is higher than all those and yeah. his floor is lower than all of those <laughs> That's, also true. That, it's 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 the extreme case right of okay like the floor could be honestly like just doesn't finish the season yeah. and then the ceiling is Holy crap, like this guy, you know, looks like Patrick Mahomes. Like it's a very, it's one of the wider ranges you're gonna find, especially in that area of the draft. So I think you want to embrace some volatility like that on your team. So I, I I'm with you. I think you should definitely take some shots. It's just a it's it's a huge range versus I think those other guys, people are like, okay, I know what I'm getting with Geno, Matthew Stafford, and some of these other guys. I mentioned, uh, again, Cousins, Stafford, Rodgers. They're all going pick 147 or later in early ADP right now. Could be even lower in non-best ball leagues where, again, you are mostly yeah, just be. taking one quarterback. So after that, Dwayne, we have Watson, Baker, Geno, Levis, Bryce Young, and Drake May. If you had to throw one dart at that group, Girl Scout comes sauntering to your girl, you know, <laughs> to your door, which one would you be going with? Personally, I see the upside case for Watson. He'd probably be my second pick, but I think I lean Will Levis. Yeah, I think it's probably Levis. But, I mean, I'm drafting plenty of Drake, May, and Bryce Young as well. I, I think you named all the right names. I want exposure to all those players. But if I had to pick and it was only one with what the Titans have done to improve their wide receiver room and they've changed their head coach and offensive coordinator, I feel like they're pushing the chips in to see what they have in Levis. Now, it may not work out. But I at least feel like all the signals are there to say, we're going to find out. We will see what goes on with the Deshaun Watson experience. The Browns can't get out of this contract without a trade. And I'm, you know, guessing no one's going to be exactly lining up to trade for Deshaun Watson these days. They cannot get out of it until 2026 at the earliest, man. Even if they go through this year and next year, I mean, they would lose 46 million against the cap. 110 million in dead money, bro. If they cut him in. A they need him to work out. I mean, there's no, is there a player on any team that a team is praying works out more than the Browns are for Watson? I, I don't think there is. There is absolutely not. And I don't even feel the need to yeah. go through team by team. <laughs> and check. So we're well, good. Mention this a little bit before, you know, in the Watson, uh, you know, just discussion. But yeah, Nick Chubb dealing with the pain coming off a multi ligament injury that did require two separate surgeries. Now we do have learned doctors saying that it is possible he is back by week one. We have not heard that from the Browns specifically. They are being slow about it, but it seems like more specifically, you know, from Dr. Edwin Porras. Shout out to uh, Sam Sherman from Established to Run. Great Twitter account, you know, great overall worker. And he had a good article talking about pup candidates and he uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Edwin Porras. But anyway, Edwin's point was that while he could be back by week one, he might not ever have the same sort of efficiency being an aging back and now coming off really his second career major knee surgery. So Browns accordingly did restructure their deal with Chubb. But at the same time, Dwayne, if they really weren't expecting him to be back sooner i would you know i'm surprised that they didn't do more to actually ramp up the backups here yes we still have jerome ford but naeem hines is coming off his own acl injury that one from a jet skiing accident and then deontay foreman one year veteran minimum one point two nine million dollar deal yes i understand foreman looked fine for portions of his you know career with the panthers and i believe the texans as well but he was getting healthy scratch for portions of last season in chicago so you know am i am i reading too much into it i just feel like chubb's going to be back sooner rather than later and even if he's not going to be this 5.5 yards per carry guy man we're talking about a running back that's probably going to be leading the browns in touches more weeks than not by October and he's regularly starting to go outside the top 140 picks. Yeah, early in the offseason, he was just going too early. Um, if you guys pick up the Fantasy Life magazine, like the guy I wrote up, and we wrote these back in the beginning of, of May on some of these summaries, 
you know, it's like the guy I'm fading was Nick Chubb. And I think then he was like a round pick 110 to 115. Yeah. So he, the market has really adjusted on a lot of the injured players. And you do you do great work talking about these injured players. I remember a couple of years ago, we had the Gus Edwards thing. Oh, yeah. And you're like, never again. I'm going to make sure we're researching all these <laughs> all these injuries before the season happens. And you've done a fantastic job with that. But a lot of these guys like TJ Hawkinson has now fallen down. They were they were absolutely on my do not draft list. Hawkinson, Chubb, I just didn't see the reason to be. And that was after me going through the projections. I was like, I can't project these guys for anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have Nick Chubb right now still projected for eight games. I probably do need to adjust that at this point to maybe something more like I give running backs 15 and a half games anyway. So maybe put him up to 12 ish and then we'll just kind of play it from there. We'll see what happens through training camp. But he is getting to the range where I've clicked on him a couple of times. Now, I'm not doing it if it's not lining up in a way that I really think benefits my roster. I need I, there. I have to have a need for running back, obviously, yeah. on my team when I'm taking him. And then I'm also typically looking, does it line up in some way as far as if I'm in best ball or the schedule? I know we say that about every player, so I should <laughs> probably stop saying that. Producer uh, Matt Swing would probably love that if I, if I stopped. It would save like 20 seconds probably per comment. So... With Chubb, I am more willing to do it now, Ian, but I don't want to hang my hat on him in any way. Um, you know, I think, you know, the the comments from Porus are probably dead on. Even if we get him back, what is it? Now, Nick Chubb has been one of the best, I know this is so cliche at this point to say, pure, pure rusher runners <laughs> in the NFL uh, for the last, you know, seven, six, seven years, whatever it's been. So, I mean, he's got some room to give and still be pretty good. Like, I mean, this guy is an elite running back, so he could still end up being decent. I will say this. I don't get into a lot of the other backs on Cleveland. Like I'm willing to sprinkle them in, but if I'm playing best ball, I look at it and I'm like, by the time week 17 and 16 get here, when I really need to be scoring fantasy points, Nick Chubb's probably going to be a problem for those other guys. Other running backs, Jerome Ford coming off an 1100 total yard season, nine touchdowns. I mean, if you just look at his top five plays from last year, you're seeing, you know, some awesome cutbacks across the grain, you know, and just ripping off these big explosive plays, but also was, you know, sadly boasting the league's single highest percentage of carries 27 percent that resulted in a loss or no gain so truly a boomer bust runner and accordingly i do think that he's going to still be stuck you know in that one b role and as we saw last year Dwayne, even without nick chubb yeah ford was good i had to start him in you know plenty of leagues it was fine but he also wasn't someone that we were just you know putting in the top 12 you know set him in your rb1 spot and forget about it much more of a you know kind of low end rb2 with a bit more upside in full PPR. So honestly, that's kind of been what Cleveland has done over the years. I mean, Chubb, in terms of his expected PPR points per game, RB28, RB20, and only RB18 from 2020 to 2022. So are you really in, though, on Foreman, Dwayne? Because look, he's pretty much free at the end of these drafts. And if Chubb is out, I do think he'll have a chance to get some, you know, early down work, but I would still think Jerome Ford leads the team and touches more weeks than not. And I mean, we've seen by now, especially with Hines on the roster too, certainly not getting any, you know, receiving work for Foreman. So how valuable are, you know, 10 to 12 carries in this offense? Really? I think Foreman is honestly Chubb and Ford getting injured away from really being someone we're at all excited about slotting into a starting lineup. I mean, he's a last round pick and the reality is we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he's on, I, I like Kevin Stefanski as a run game, you know, coordinator. Uh, I, I like him as an awesome, as an offensive coordinator period, but like his, his, uh, his rushing, you know, production is usually pretty good. Now he's had some good players to go along with that. The foreman's kind of like the Khalif Raymond of running backs. Like when he gets his chances, it's still like, Oh, guy's pretty good. No, I will say last year they didn't want to leave slander. Yeah. They didn't want to give, uh, you know, they didn't want to give the carries inside the five to Jerome Ford last year. Again, that's not a very sticky stat. They could change their mind on that in a heartbeat. But I could I could see Foreman being the guy that gets the carries down inside the five-yard line. I think he's fine. It's a late-round pick. Not going out of my way for it. Maybe I'm just tuning the weeds on fantasy Twitter, but I think people are drastically overstating, you know, Foreman's being all that good on just dead in the water. I think water, ADP is the real teams. story, though. I mean, that, I, right. I get with you. I'm with you. I, yeah. When I start seeing stuff like that, I just remember, okay, ADP represents thousands and thousands and thousands of drafts at this <laughs> point, true. and the market's not buying in to the things that the talking heads or whatever we want to call it, which yeah. call us talking heads, you know, it's that true. they're not saying, <laughs> that, that, that they are saying anyway. They're not buying in, so I'm not worried about that. I'm Foreman.
I'm also breaking my own rule of like try not to talk shit about players with such a low ADP. So I'll chill out. But yeah, guys, let's talk about the real, you know, star, I guess, at this point of the Browns offense. Amari Cooper hoping to get paid, uh, you know, a bit more after putting up two pretty awesome seasons with the Browns. Back to back wide receiver 17 finishes in terms of PPR points per game. Will finally be turning 30 here after seemingly being 22 throughout his entire career. But yeah, Dwayne, he's looked like a number one wide receiver since joining the Browns. 15th in yards per route run 23rd in targets per route run again back-to-back top 20 finishes in fantasy land so why is he going wide receiver 29 in drafts right now even though he actually has averaged more receiving yards with watson under center versus other quarterbacks over these past two seasons well technically he's never had a wide receiver one season yet if you're going by points per game and you're looking at the average of what a wide receiver one's been since 2011, which is over 16 fantasy points per game. I'm talking PPR. Amari's always finished just, he's been close to that, but he's really been a high end wide receiver too. So I think that's part of it. You're going into age 30 season. The recent research I did suggests that Amari's fine. Like 30 is not really an age you're going to have to worry about, but I think people worry about Deshaun Watson. I think the positive here is over the last two seasons with Deshaun on the field, 24% target share. Well, that's still basically Amari. Like that's a high end wide receiver too. 2.34 yards per route run. That's almost wide receiver one worthy to your point. 63% catch rate. Like with his A dot, you'd expect that to be around 67, 68%. So that's a little bit of something that's holding him back. Uh, You know, the lack of completion percentage whenever Deshaun Watson is targeting him. But if that were to turn around, I think you're fine. I, I'm I'm good drafting Amari. I don't go out of the way because I think we know. Like, okay, great, it's a wide receiver too. <laughs> but I think that's the other big party. And people are like, I know he's a wide receiver too. I want to draft someone that might end up being able to turn into a wide receiver one. The other challenge is you could also be drafting a wide receiver that turns into a wide receiver three, and Amari's still a wide receiver two. So I think he's fine where he goes and drafts. I can see why people are not super excited on clicking on him, and that's why he slides down the board a little bit. But most likely, he's going to outperform his ADP as he seemingly does every year over the last three seasons. Don't under don't underestimate the boom upside here. 265 yards and two touchdowns against the Texans in week 16 last year certainly helped many people advance. Would have been a lot cooler if he didn't get injured and then not be able he to. He has play. those games, man. He's he yeah. did it in Dallas against the Eagles. He did yeah. it in Dallas against the Commanders. I mean, he had he's had some monster games where you look at it and you're like, God, I do look at him at times and wonder how has this guy never been a top three fantasy I receiver? Know. Like I mean, he's a he's a good player. So, again, I get the reasons why he's not in the group of, like, Malik Neighbors, DK Metcalf, and DJ Moore, you know, going maybe a round earlier. But I really wouldn't purely be fading him, guys, because of this Deshaun Watson idea that he's just not going to be able to produce. Last season, yes, in week one, there was a dud, kind of a, you know, iffy game there, but only 37 yards for Cooper. The other four games he played with Watson, seven catches, 90 yards, 116 yards and a touchdown, 139 yards and a touchdown, and then 98 yards against the big, bad Ravens. So, Really has been far more good than bad for Cooper with Watson under center. Hopefully he gets his new contract and is fully motivated to keep on keeping on in 2024 and beyond. All right, Dwayne, slight, you know, change going on with the offense while Kevin Stefanski is back and presumably still, you know, running things on that side of the football. Their new OC is, in fact, Ken Dorsey, who during his time with the Bills was still leading a a pretty damn efficient offense and had the eighth highest pass play rate. So PFF's ranking 22nd ranked offensive line returns all five starters, hoping for some better performance through continuity. Are you expecting this to be more of a pass first offense in 2024 based on Dorsey, based on Watson being hopefully healthy and based? on Chubb, maybe not being at his usual self? I I think Ken Dorsey's shown us he wants to throw the ball more. Last year, obviously, the Bills moved on and they turned into more of a run-heavy offense under Joe Brady. But this all comes back to Deshaun Watson. The number one driver and whether or not you're going to throw the ball a lot, you know, is, is your quarterback good? And if your quarterback's not good, you're going to do everything you can until the game strip forces your hand to try to disguise things and keep that player hidden. And the thing with the Browns is, Stefanski has been very good at doing that. Stefanski has been someone that's been able to dial up a lot of great stuff in the run game. Very heavy play action guy, second most in the league. And it's also still undetermined right now who the play caller is going to be as of the last mini camps where someone, I think people have asked Devin, Kevin Stefanski this mm-hmm. question. And like now his comment is, okay, I'll let you know when I know. <laughs> so we don't know for sure who the play caller is going to be. I still lean to it being Stefanski, either Stefanski managing Dorsey or Stefanski just saying, I'm just going to call the plays because honestly, 
he's a very good play caller. So I'm going to lean towards the Brown being the Browns being more like what they have been. I will say there's a chance they throw a little bit more with the addition of Jerry Judy, things like that. But again, it does come back to Deshaun Watson taking a step forward. Reigning number 10 ranked scoring offense. So yeah, I would say Stefanski is doing a pretty good job. Keep on keeping on. Also, keep on keeping on going over to our fine friends over at DraftKings. That's right, everyone. We have partnered with DraftKings Sportsbook. And right now, all new customers who bet just $5 will get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings app now and sign up using our promo code FANCYLIFE. And yeah, same game parlays are a freaking great time or just regular parlays. Personally, I love just throwing a couple MLB lines out there bet on my guardians bet against the white Sox because they absolutely suck conveniently they're playing each other right now so that's been you know even easier for me and then usually bet on the yankees or dodgers because big market teams i feel like when even though you know it'd be a lot cooler if they didn't so if sports betting is not yet available in your state don't worry DraftKings is the one-stop shop for all things daily fantasy where you can join in on all the fun and have the shot to win cash prizes make sure you check out Dwayne and myself on the fantasy life youtube page gone live baby friday 9 30 a.m eastern we will look to try to cash in and take first place in DraftKings basically million dollar contest. So again, guys, that's code fantasy life. Bet just five dollars on any wager and get one hundred fifty dollars of bonus bets instantly. Promo code fantasy life only at DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Dwayne, for a team that was pretty good last season, again, you know, best defense in the NFL, still a top 10 ranked scoring offense, just an eight and a half win total with a minus 140 lean on the over here. Again, with the juice kind of telling us the direction the market's going and probably what we should be favoring. But I do like the over here and I'm more confident in it than some of the other teams we've been talking about. Again, just looking at the overall roster here, I think it's one of the more complete, you know, top to bottom groups in football, reigning number one, number one ranked defense. How many times can I say that? Stay tuned and find out. God forbid Watson just gives us league average play. Even slightly below average, I think they can clear this eight and a half mark. I'm in on the Browns. Man, I I, I struggle with this one. Again, it comes back to Deshaun Watson, but they were leading on only 26% of their plays last year. Typically for teams you know, that are going to get over that number we're talking about, it's going to be a little bit higher than that. That's something I like to look at. They were honestly a coin flip a lot of the times. And so I feel like the ball really bounced their way last season. Now, there's a long way you can fall from 11 wins to just be over an eight and a half. Um, so again, if Watson can clean up his act, I think they end up getting over this. If he doesn't, he's looked more like what he's looked over the previous two seasons. They're going to be under. And I, maybe I'm just burned, Ian, but I am going to take the under. They were six and two in one score games. If you look at their expected win loss record, just based on point differential, 9.4 and seven and six. Shout out to Pro Football Reference. So, yeah, maybe exactly, you know, didn't have all the underlying qualities of an 11 win team, but hey, take away two wins. They still clear that mark. We shall see what happens. But Dwayne mentioned him briefly, but one of the new, you know, hopeful stars in Cleveland now. Former Broncos wide receiver Jerry Judy joining a backup, you know, group of wide receivers. Not backup, but just non-Amari Cooper group of receivers featuring Elijah Moore, Cedric Tillman, David Bell, amongst others. So sure, it does seem like Judy is going to be the two. I mean, he got that three-year, $52 million extension for a reason. But we're also hearing, you know, more Elijah Moore propaganda, Dwayne. Now, just remember, everyone, when you're going through all this, you know, training camp hype, pay attention because you don't want to miss out on the next Puka Nakua, but make sure you ignore everything they say about Elijah Moore and Justin Ross and those other guys don't want to go down that route. I'm not bitter at all, Dwayne. Definitely didn't draft too much uh, Elijah Moore last year. But Judy is someone who I think really was flashing earlier in his career, and that's reflected in his ESPN Open score. League's 10th best separator in 2021, 11th in 2022, fell to 38th last year where really – his most noteworthy ach achievements were getting chewed out by Steve Smith on national TV. And that one admittedly really cool time where he faked the forward pass while he was already downfield and it actually worked. So that was fun. He's more affordable than ever. Interested in buying back low on Jerry Judy, Dwayne? Uh, I'm getting some shares, but I I'm not trying to get overconfident in it. I mean, I think, I think the big struggle we see with Jerry Judy is whenever teams really want to go man co coverage and they want to press him, like he's just not up to it. And so that means at any moment he could be taken away. And you've mentioned yourself a lot of times zone really looks like, man, if there's no one else in the vicinity, you know, and, and like your guy is your guy that can really be more like a man coverage play. So 0 0.87 yards per route run last year against man coverage. Now that's not a super sticky stat year over year, but that's been something that's been a bit of challenge for Jerry Judy for the course of his career. So I, I, I just, 
I'm challenged to find a way to think that he's going to earn that many targets and a balance to potentially run heavy offense where we've already talked about the consistency of Amari Cooper. And I think David Njoku has shown enough that he's a better player than Jerry Judy. J David Njoku is not going to get a 25% target share or anything, you know, but he's going to be enough. He's going to be around 20%. Amari's probably going to be 23, 24%. Like I just don't see the room for Jerry Judy. And honestly, I don't know how they paid him this money. I don't know how the Browns went out there and paid him what he's getting. Um, I'm pretty surprised by that. So, again, willing to tack him on at the end of a draft, but Jerry Judy's not a player that I'm going out of my way to target. $41 million guaranteed on that deal. That was the part that kind of shocked me. So, yeah, they are tied to him for at least these next two years. Not quite the uh, Watson contract, I think we can say, but certainly not a great one either. So, it does sound like he actually might be the favorite to work out of the slot. Some of the words from Minicamp were that Cedric Tillman could actually be the number three, you know, on the outside. Judy in the slot. Amari, as you know, they're tried and true, number one. But, hey, guys, he already had plenty of, you know, snaps in the slot in Denver. He already had a team that was featuring him and actually throwing the ball more than what we saw in Cleveland, still couldn't make it work. So I'm with you, Dwayne. You know, he's wide receiver 61, pick 124 in early ADP, going next to guys like Brandon Cooks, Mike Williams, Jacoby Myers. So certainly not to draft him in round four like, you know, you did a few years ago as early as last year, actually. That was a freaking horrific mistake. But, yeah, someone that, again, if I am building a Brown stack, maybe otherwise – probably not buying too far back in. You mentioned, though, Dwayne, probably the number two pass game option in Cleveland is actually their tight end, David Njoku. Only averaged 0.12 fewer PPR points per game than George Kittle last season. If we include playoff production for everyone, he was actually the tight end five. So the problem with Njoku is, unlike Amari Cooper, he's had pretty stark splits with and without Watson. With Watson in 10 games, only averaging 5.4 targets and 34 yards. Without 7.6 targets and 60 yards. Njoku has failed to clear 60 yards even one time with Watson under center. And Dwayne, I think we're seeing a bit of the impact of dual threat quarterbacks on the tight end in Cleveland. Because Njoku, if you watch the way they use him, not too much going on downfield. I know he's athletic enough to stretch the seam and everything, but just a 4.8 yard dot, And I think the lack of checkdowns from Watson messes that up. Last year, Watson had one of the highest scramble rates in the league, and he regularly let pressures be turned into sacks. Meanwhile, Joe Flacco never scrambled and was actually very good at not letting pressures turn into sacks. So overall thoughts on the Joku bouncing, not bouncing back, but honestly keeping on, keeping on with Watson under center. He's certainly not being priced as someone that, again, at times last year was a top five producer at the position. So his talent profile says he's a wide receiver. He's a tight end four to six, like his talent profile over the last few years. So he, he's got the underlying goods to make this thing work. I think the question is, what does happen with, again, Deshaun Watson, all roads lead to the quarterback here. Surprise, surprise. But it is a small sample. Hey, Deshaun Watson, you want to go better than 200 passing yards per game? Start throwing the ball to freaking David and Joku, you nitwit. Like, come on, man. Like, a, and a 7% scramble rate isn't unsurmountable. Like, what you don't want to see is guys at 10, 11%, and mm -hmm. then be thinking about trying to have two players from an offense takes us back to the Baltimore Ravens because that's where uh, yeah. Lamar Jackson is at. So I think it could still be okay. I, I think you're I think you're correct though. It's it the low A dot players are who lose their targets when quarterbacks are willing to scramble. Whether that's the tight end on a swing pass, whether that's the tight end on a drag, whether that's a running back on a swing pass, those are the guys that are going to get they're going to get hurt the most. And Deshaun Watson's shown us over the course of his career, Ian, he wants to hold on to the ball longer and try to find the big plays down the field. Hasn't necessarily worked out here over the last uh, couple of seasons, but that doesn't necessarily fit with the way they're trying to use David and Joku. So I get why drafters are a little bit nervous about this. And right now, I mean, Brock Bowers goes ahead of David and Joku at this point, you know, so yeah. I, I have it as a tier, Ian. I've got really Evan Ingram, Jake Ferguson, David and Joku, Dallas Goddard, and Brock Bowers. So if people want to keep passing him over, like he's a guy that I do find take I find myself taking if I haven't taken one of the top five tight ends earlier in the draft. Backup quarterback, not Joe Flacco anymore, but it is Jameis Winston who perhaps could open things up. But, you know, we're not going to start comping and seeing what everyone's doing. That would actually probably be good for the entire offense. It, it probably would help. <laughs> for fantasy. 
I'm not saying it's going to win you Browns a division or anything, but for fantasy, Jameis Winston would be better for everyone. It'd be fun for uh, the press conferences, too. I will say that. Final note here, only Evan Ingram actually had more screen targets than Njoku last year. So, again, we're not saying Njoku is going to be crap or anything. He's a fantasy lab consensus tight end 10 for a reason. But it looked like he could actually start challenging, you know, that top five group down the stretch of last season when he was just going off week after week. I do think there's far more concern with the switch to Watson under center for Foreigner Joku, then Amari Cooper, and honestly, the rest of this offense. So, takes us to our final part of the team previews, Dwayne. If the Browns were a TV or a movie character, who would they be? I am going with Darth Vader. There's some obvious talent here, but let's face it, a lot of people aren't really big fans of the uh, leading character in Cleveland these days. And yes, there were much better days in the past, you know, before Anakin decided to kill all those kids and, you know, really go to the dark side. People were behind him and looking at him at like one of the leading, you know, guys in the league or the universe, I guess, in this case. But yeah, now on the dark side. But hey, Dwayne, you know what? The dark side looks pretty loaded. So, you know, we'll see if uh, we end up getting the Disney sort of ending where the good guys win or if maybe it's a bit more of a uh, what was that movie? Eleven Monkeys or whatever it was, where maybe the bad guys go ahead and get things done as well. So I got Darth vader for the 2024 cleveland browns specifically you know your boy deshaun watson so well, good, what say you good pull on 11 monkeys there thank uh, you well i'll go with an actor that was in 11 monkeys and bruce willis and i'll go with die hard it's a similar theme to you and it's hans gruber you know it's the villain everyone <laughs> loves to hate and that's deshaun yeah. watson right now people <laughs> love to hate deshaun watson and his play is making it that much easier i mean they already hate him as a human being and now whenever you look what's happening with his play i think it's just so easy so, yeah, I'll go with Hans Gruber from Die Hard, but really good one on Darth Vader. Appreciate you, man. And appreciate you guys for tuning in to another edition of the Fantasy Life Podcast. So we'll see what happens, Browns fans. But ultimately, you guys have won 11 games in two of the last four years. That's pretty freaking good relative to, you know, what was going on the previous 15 to 20 years. So we'll see what happens in 2024. If you guys want more information on the Browns, feel free to check out my team preview over at FantasyLife.com. All 32 squads are done at this point. Also, check out Dwayne's projections, our Fantasy Life consensus ranks, and please subscribe to our always free newsletter. And maybe even our YouTube page, but it's a free country, so I'll trust you guys to do that. So for Dwayne, for producer Matt, I'm Ian. Thanks again for tuning in to Fantasy Life Podcast. Until next time, take care, everybody.